3. Police State Though Kalugin would be recalled to Moscow in the early 1970s, it was no damper on his momentum. His return brought a promotion into foreign counterintelligence. Soon, he was the head of his branch and the youngest general in KGB history. From here, he had an eagle's eye view of KGB activities around the world. Vienna, Paris, and New Delhi swarmed with KGB influence, but even Washington, D.C. was not immune. Kalugin had another view that was much less attractive. The bad behavior of connected individuals in the KGB and Communist Party was routinely swept under the rug, whether it was theft, fraud, or even extorting Russian Orthodox clergy. In the KGB, officers increasingly were promoted because of who they knew, not what they had accomplished. Men of strong character and high professional ability became suspect, while obsequious yes-men climbed higher and higher. Eventually, Kalugin would run afoul of such leaders. One of these was Vladimir Kruchkov, Kalugin's boss, who would lead a coup attempt against Mikhail Gorbachev in 1991. Another was the head of the KGB in Moscow, Viktor Lieden. Kalugin describes him as one of the biggest sons of bitches in all the KGB. The aftermath of that episode was a transfer to domestic security. It was the beginning of the end of Kalugin's KGB career. In January 1980, Kalugin took up his post as deputy chief of the KGB office in Leningrad. It was a bitter homecoming, but he was resolved to make the best of it. He reported for duty at the big house, where his father had been an NKVD guard decades earlier. From here, he came to understand the true state of the Soviet Union. He was struck by the sheer scale of KGB intrusion into the lives of ordinary citizens. Nearly 1,000 KGB employees, working in a warren of rooms, were involved around the clock in monitoring and recording phone wiretaps and other bugs. At any given time, there were dozens of phones, offices, and apartments being bugged. We had the capacity, through special hookups, to record any conversation in the city. However, the surveillance yielded little in the way of intelligence. Clearly, there was no espionage or sedition in their districts, but the local KGB men and countless informers were filing absurd reports containing gossip, rumors, and paranoid ruminations on the security situation. We had an expression in Russia for this meaningless scurrying about. Mice games. And mice games were about the only thing our local KGB officers were engaged in. Authoritarians often subject artists to extra scrutiny and persecution. A common trait of dictators is to destroy what they can't control, like an overzealous gardener who sees only weeds in a field of wild flowers. Kalugin saw how the KGB treated Leningrad's most prominent artists and intellectuals, how they were followed, their apartments and phones bugged, and their residences and offices searched. Many from this community befriended Kalugin, including conductor Yuri Tamerkinov, theater director Georgi Tovstoganov, and Boris Piotrovsky, director of the Hermitage Museum. I was surprised at first that Leningrad's cultural elite would welcome a KGB general into their salons. I think as time went by and our association created no problems for them, my Leningrad artist friends realized that I was genuine and not an informant. During these years, Kalugin read the KGB's three-volume case file on renowned Russian poet Anna Akhmatova. For almost 40 years, from 1927 to her death in 1966, Akhmatova had been targeted by Soviet security. Her file was full of nasty reports from the legions of informers who had been persuaded to work against the poet. They spread rumors and innuendo. The KGB had hounded this woman and monitored her every move for decades. And as I read through the documents and thought of my own growing struggle with the security apparatus, a line from one of Akhmatova's poems kept running through my mind. Everything is stolen, betrayed, sold. Police State, Russian Federation. Police State will be defined as a country in which repressive government control is exercised over its citizens through the legal system and law enforcement. According to its constitution, the Russian Federation is a democratic, federative, law-based state with a republican form of government. The reality is that since Vladimir Putin came to power in 1999, his government has steadily eroded the power of Russian citizens to oppose his rule. Two manifestations of the police state can be seen in Russia. In the first, 
ever more draconian laws restrict the rights and freedoms of the general public. The Foreign Agent Law went into effect in November 2012 in response to widespread protests against Putin's third term in office. The law imposes special legal requirements and restrictions on individuals and organizations accused of receiving support or influence from outside Russia. In practice, anyone who expresses views that don't align with those of Putin's government may be branded as a foreign agent, including Nobel Prize-winning journalist Dmitry Moratov, whose publication Novaya Gazeta lost its license in 2023. In March 2022, the Russian Federation adopted Article 207-3. It criminalizes public dissemination of knowingly false information on the use of the armed forces of the Russian Federation. Also known as the Don't Say War Law, it has been used to arrest thousands of opponents of Russia's war in Ukraine. In the Russian police state's second manifestation, the legal system becomes a weapon. Bogus charges are brought against individuals who pose a specific threat to the power and perceived legitimacy of Putin's government. The following examples illustrate this tactic. Yuri Shutov, a politician in St. Petersburg. He collected incriminating evidence on the financial misdeeds of members of city administration, including Mayor Anatoly Sobchak and his aide Vladimir Putin. Shutov was accused of murdering politicians Mikhail Manyevich and Galina Starovoy Tova in 1999. Court determined the charges were unproven and politically motivated. Shutov died in prison of untreated medical conditions in 2014. Sergei Magnitsky, a tax auditor who exposed corruption and misconduct by Russian government officials against his client's company. Magnitsky was arrested for collusion in 2008 and detained without a formal trial. He died in prison in 2009 from traumatic injuries and untreated medical conditions. In 2012, the United States passed the Magnitsky Act, barring Russian citizens involved in Magnitsky's death from entering the United States. Alexei Navalny, a popular opposition candidate, he was accused of embezzlement in 2013 and 2014 on suspended sentences which effectively blocked him from further campaigning. He was poisoned in 2020 and evacuated to Germany for medical treatment for which the Russian government accused him of violating his parole. He is currently serving a 19-year prison sentence. The European Court of Human Rights determined that the charges against Navalny are political. Yuri Dmitriev, a historian whose work locating mass graves of Stalin's victims, challenges Putin's narrative of Stalin as a heroic protector of his country. Dmitriev was arrested for child pornography charges in 2016. A court-appointed team found the charges were unjustified, but the case was brought to trial three times until prosecutors obtained a guilty verdict in 2020. Dmitriev is imprisoned on a 15-year sentence 